Welcome back guys, today we will be looking at a few MCQs on infectious diseases. So I have 5 of them. So one for protozoas, elements, bacteria, fungus and virus. So uh, we will see how this goes and if you guys like it then maybe we can make more. So the first one we have a 40 year old male patient that was admitted in the ICU following convulsions and landing in coma. His fundus examination showed that there were hemorrhages, cotton wool spots and the blood mirror showed the following, name the treatment of choice. Now, in this, we can see that either by looking at the options, that's the drugs, or either by looking at the blood smear which we have shown, we can say that it has to do something with uh, malaria parasite, okay. So, that's the ring form, so that should either tell you that it's a falciparum, or look at the history. So, it's uh, convulsions, it's coma, so we are having CNS manifestations in this as well. And the fundus examination shows hemorrhages, cotton wool spots, and the blood smear showed a falciparum. Now, with the history, we are knowing that there is a CNS complication inside the brain. Okay, we are having hemorrhage, and we are having coma, and we are having convulsions. Now, hemorrhages, cotton wool spots in the retina will also be seen in case of malarial complications so in the fundus you're going to have cotton wool spots you're going to have hemorrhages you're going to have retinal opacities so in case they didn't give this picture okay they gave you a fundus where you are seeing hemorrhages and you are seeing opacities and you are seeing cotton wool spots okay and the history was the person went to a tropical region or there was a history of fever with chills so maybe think that it might also have something to do with a complicated malaria now look at the treatment, quinidine, dihydromycinine, piperaquine, atoaquine, progonin, and doxycycline. Doxycycline is eliminated, okay, you can't give it because it's not an antiprotozoal. Now quinidine is supposed to be the correct answer, we'll look at that in a moment. So dihydromycinine, and piperaquine, uh, the B and C are combinations. So combinations we use to remove the hypnozoid stages which are in the liver, okay, to remove that. So falciparum does not have a hypnotic stage. Okay, it does not rest in the liver to give you recurrent infections, no. So quinidine would be the answer of choice. But if you were a doctor and you had to give a treatment, quinidine would be your third choice. Okay, the first two would be artemisin or artisunate, artimeter. So those, after that you would go for quinidine and the fourth one would be quinine. So that's the order. So first you go for artimeter, artisunate, quinidine, then quinine. You don't just directly go for quinidine, but since it's not given the option, we have to go for quinidine, right? Next, a three-year-old baby presented with fever, rash, and the vaccine to the following infection is derived from the DAS strain. Now, uh, it's a three-year-old baby, so imagine all the immunizable infections that you can get. Now, we have a fever and rash, which is not specific, but it could point towards either dermatitis or it can go for viral fever. Now, most common you would have the thing with rash that's measles okay and they have given a clinical picture to complement it so what we are focusing on the molar and the thing behind the molar would be the retromolar trigon and in that we have these spots so those are coplic spots and it's derived from the Edmonston strain the 17d is for yellow fever and the answer is Edmonston now, a 35-year-old female with abdominal pain was suggested for a CT where a cyst was found in the liver. The aspirate showed the following organism, which of the following animal is involved in the life cycle. So, the thing you're, uh, we are seeing there is what we call as echinococcus granulosus. Okay, it's a hydrated cyst in layman's term. Now, what happens is, when the hydrated cyst infects the liver, it forms a cyst. And we have a lot of scolexes and parasites swimming around in the cyst. But the thing is, they don't cause any symptoms. They don't uh, somehow interfere with the functioning of the liver until late stages where they start causing pressure symptoms. Because of which the patient will note a slight discomfort or pain or have some difficulty in breathing. So other than that, there won't be much symptoms. But when the cyst breaks and we have this fluid pouring out into the ECF and the blood, uh, that cases there might be a high amount of anaphylactic reactions. So that's one thing but uh, we are not seeing any anaphylaxis so the patient is still in the unsymptomatic stage asymptomatic stage and abdominal pain is status for CT so abdominal pain for her was because of something else and uh, the CT is how we usually find this thing there is always an accidental finding 90% of the time this thing will be an accidental finding 
okay so which of the animal is involved in the life cycle so dog crab cow sea cucumber now just because there is liver mentioned in the question don't think it's liver fluke okay it's not so we can eliminate crabs sea cucumbers because it's not a fluke now the second thing would be uh, is it a dog or is it a cow okay so echinococcus granulosus is mainly seen in the shepherd population okay so if the option was either sheep yeah it would have uh, met it properly humans yes now sometimes what happens is shepherds rear dogs as a method of shepherding and these dogs sometimes eat the sheep meat so dog is uh, involved and if there is any relative of the dog that they have given like wolves or jackals or those things yeah that might also be done so the answer here would be dog now which is not the cause or risk factor for the following condition so what do we have we have oral thrush caused by candida fungus so we know that in case of immunocompromised states like either hiv or diabetes mellitus or the person is on prolonged steroids treatment then uh, you will be having oral thrush or oral candidiasis but there are other reasons as well so if a patient comes to you don't directly think that it has something to do with hiv Uh, we have five options. That means there's going to be more than one correct option, right? So HIV, yes. Any immunocompromised states. Anemia, yes. Jorgen syndrome, yes. So dry mouth is also one of the risk factors where you might get oral candidiasis. Uh, not just Jorgen syndrome where you have a dry mouth, but any other cause of dry mouth. So. Um, excessive mouth breathing, uh, but uh, that would be have to be rare. Um, Ill-fitting dentures. Uh, chronic trauma from uh, jagged teeth so all these things can cause uh, or candidiasis now renal failure is uh, somewhere on the borderline so if the person is actually suffering from renal failure there's no reason why i would get that but because of renal failure he goes for a transplant gets the new kidney get it gets it implanted in him and then starts on the immunocompromisation therapy or immunosuppression therapy then maybe but uh, no not d uh, excessive and uh, antibiotic use yes because if you use antibiotics excessively these antibiotics will kill your natural flora which are in your mouth uh, these die they can't protect your mouth because they were your commensals you provided them with nutrients and a place to stay and they provided you with the defense now they're not there so bacteria which or uh, foreign organisms which would not normally be in your mouth are now entering your mouth and they're not being killed now because of that they will start to grow and they will cause infections opportunistic infections like oral thrush so the last one treatment line against which the organism is not resistant so what are we seeing in the picture we are seeing gram negative diplococci okay so gram negative diplococci which are present both inside the cell as well as outside the cell and that's just not an ordinary cell that looks like a neutrophil so which organism can live and survive and multiply inside a neutrophil which is a diplococcus and is gram negative and can also live extracellularly so the answer would be nisaria so this picture is from a person suffering from gonococcal urethritis okay so uh, when this area was you know discovered somewhere around the 1900 so 1920 or something around uh, like that uh, we started using penicillins against them uh, they developed resistance against that very soon like all other bacteria we know uh, then we went for tetracyclines because we thought a broad, broad spectrum might be a better choice but it wasn't so finally the thing that Uh, we are left with our third generation cephalosporins and aminoglycosides so streptomycin so these two are the last things that we hold on so last line of defense between humanity and nisaria and then again some cases have been reported where we are seeing resistance against uh, again third generation cephalosporins and streptomycin as well but uh, let's hope for the best so anyway thank you guys this has been a few mcqs on infectious diseases so this is how we need to attempt them basically they will um, ask you for the risk factors and they'll ask you for the modalities of treatment so mainly you need to know the treatment why it occurs and the presentation so if you are clinically thorough so basically they don't want much of theoretical thing so they just want to know if you get a patient with this particular particular presentations 
then how would you diagnose it and how would you treat it so you need to know the drugs and you need to know which type of history will relate to that particular organism and which type of symptoms and clinical presentation you can relate to that particular disease and how you can manage it properly so that's basically all they look when you're uh, talking about pages but then again there are exceptions so um, comment in the comment section below like how you like the video and would you like to see more i'll see you guys in my next video until next time bye